This is Mario Oliva, general producer of the uh, AFE Festival in Cuba. It's a pleasure to uh, present our first activity within the festival. It's a panel called New Generations, Music, Resilience, and a Mixture of Genders as a way for development. We are joined by a, a panel from Havana, Mauricio Abad, the uh, artist and artistic director and uh, of our festival. He was the founder of my producing company. He also produced, uh, sorry, he also um, formed an artistic group. We also have Big Lead from Colombia, um, producer, DJ, ghetto curator, and he heads Paria Records. It's a pleasure to have from Argentina, Feli Cabrera, an electronic music producer, transmedia artist, and a trans activist who is non-binary, a Colombian professor who lives in Buenos Aires. They also create um, audiovisual installations. And it's also a pleasure to have from the UK, Janine Irons. She is a British uh, musical educator She's a manager for artists and producers. In 1991, she formed with uh, Gary Crossfit, an organization for uh, musical education, Tomorrow's Warrior. She's an executive director there. We are very happy to have you all here. And now I will give the floor to Mauricio Abad so he can start the panel. We are here today presenting this panel or new generations, music, resilience, and a mixture of genders as a way for development. And at our festival, we find it striking. I'm the uh, artistic director of the festival and a musical curator there. And we are very happy to share the ideas of our festival with you all. The festival was created in 2017. This is our fifth year. We will be starting with our fifth edition on December 9th. Originally, it was an in-person festival, but because of the pandemic, we have had to move to the new platforms. And what we want to discuss today has to do with music um, can be a way to develop young Cuban producers and young producers who work in electronic music. And it's been amazing to see how in the past two years they have been able to maintain their musical production in spite of the situation in Cuba. We are talking about a festival which is held once a year on the second weekend of December. We usually have an audience of between 5,000 and 10,000 people live. It's an electronic music festival, but the curatorial concept for our festival is that we work with 99% um, of music produced in Cuba, 
maybe with some remix from an international song, but our philosophy is to promote the creation of music that mixes Cuban sounds and rhythms and turns them into enjoyable electronic music for the youth. Just to give you an idea in figures, the festival this year will have 78 artists from across all the country. And we will have rhythms like dubstep, fusion bass, house, techno. These are some of the rhythms we are seeing the most in uh, what the um, uh, young people are mixing with our regional music, which uh, has a lot of Yoruba music because we have a lot of African influences because of colonization. And what's most interesting is how um, these kids in countries where uh, there's no Spotify end up producing uh, for sessions of 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes with original music, with uh, remixes or mashups or original songs. And it's really wonderful to see how not only one discipline of creators, because we, we, we're trying, we're starting to reach all kinds of audiences. And by using cracked programs or programs uh, that we get through alternative means, let's say, they end up producing high creative level material. I'm going to share now for just a little second. No, I can't. I wanted to share some of our graphs, but well, I'm going to send them to you afterwards. Um, some recordings from Spotify. Uh, we think it's really interesting to see how these kids um, evade or face the obstacles in the way in order to create a new product, a product that allows us as an audience to analyze the narratives in their heads, the Cuba they are building, the future they see for Cuba, and all from their music. We're talking, we're saying that there are kids right now who have streams in hundreds of countries around the world. Um, producers like Inside, for example, uh, he has 28,000 streams on SoundCloud for a year, for this year. And for an industry musician, uh, this is not much, but we're talking about kids producing at home. They produce with uh, a computer that probably works on Windows XP. And I'm seeing the graph of uh, Lucy on Spotify this year. It has 22,000 streams in 2021 in 84 countries. And all this exercise of resiliency of growth was developed in the past two years. In 2019, between 2019 and between and 2021. Before that, we didn't have in this kind of independent distribution. Um, it basically creates a platform for them to show their work 
But at the same time, we don't give them resources for the work they do. Um, electronic producer in Cuba usually um, gets by by working at bars or discos. They weren't able to do that in the past two years, but somehow they have found a way to um, persist, to thrive in spite of that. And in this festival, we're going to see a bit of the results of the music they produced during those two years. We like to call it the sound of the pandemic, the music that was created in that period, the music that they produced for the festival. We, of course, it's not mandatory. We do try to stimulate them. Um, there are producers who don't work maybe with uh, Cuban sounds, but we do like to think that we, we inspire them to, to keep on working with their own rhythms. Ines was the um, curator, curator here, but I always like to mention that in 2016, when Mayor Laser was in Havana, you might remember that it was a massive show, uh, about 400,000 people met there. It was at a time when uh, Dinon, their hit song was everywhere. And that concert was opened by Cuban DJ, uh, DJs and producers who were randomly chosen by our group. I was lucky enough to work as a production assistant there at that concert. And I remember that in internal discussions, in the heat of the moment, some producers who are friends of mine, and we would we talked about the trick or the formula for success of Mayor Laser had to do with having mixed these two elements, the pop element of electronic music with other more exotic uh, elements, like the sounds from the Caribbean and Africa. And they told me, we are wasting so much time Cuban producers, because we're not using those rhythms. And if you study the um, electronic music in Cuba before 2017 and after 2017, you can really see how after the foundation of our festival, a new generation um, of electronic music was born in Cuba. And our festival keeps those roots alive and maintains them alive and sees these new generations moving towards experimentation with um, streaming platforms. And we are talking about independent musicians with all the limitations we have in Cuba. We uh, we'll keep on discussing this. I will finish by now, and I would like to give the floor to Clip B from Colombia. Mario introduced him. He's from Colombia and Puerto Rico. He's a DJ as well. He lives in Bogota, and he heads several record companies. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your intervention. Um, I think that really for those of us who are struggling and who have been struggling for a while now uh, regarding the Latin American aesthetics of electronic music and uh, music also from the periphery, from more marginal origins uh, for us, 
it is great to hear other people's experience and to see how and what contributions we can make. And also how we can recreate a different type of situation in a different type of circumstance with respect to the proposal or the contribution that can be made as music producers, as curators, uh, and as members of those artistic practices. Because possibly, maybe because of the context of the origin or the tools or for many other reasons, but they don't have the same access. Uh, in terms of places or artists, or collectives. They don't have the same level of access. So for me, it's important to start this intervention uh, talking about what we do in Paria Records and mention the fact that it's important uh, to consider that this revolves around one important concept in the world, which is equality. And uh, this way of seeing and considering the different struggles and different contexts and different fronts in general, uh, with respect to how we do a level playing field and how based on the origin and based on many different things, we can further develop this to reach some kind of equality, yes? so that they can access uh, and uh, also enable more music ex musical exchange, exchange of knowledge, exchange and, and also possibilities of touring and really enable access to music in general. In Cuban music uh, and uh, regarding electronic music, I really love the Cuban culture um, of electronic music, I had the opportunity of working with many of them, uh, working with uh, Eduardo and other musicians, and I've produced um, many different uh, things. And uh, the context in general and the musical context is very important to, to consider, yes, when we believe uh, and we understand their production of music. I really enjoy urban Cuban music, particularly. I think it's it's super interesting, and I would like to uh, provide like a brief introduction of what we do in Paria Records. I've been a producer here for like eighteen or nineteen years already. As a record label, but also as a as a as a platform for artistic manifestation, which in general, these artistic expressions are originated in the periphery. Although, uh, of course, there is a context in which uh, there's also there's always an association with precarious elements. So we try to give value to that precarious creation and to generate new cultural manifestation as a result, because there are no external conditioning factors. That's one of the main struggles. Besides the, having uh, references that we all may have, you know, influences from everywhere uh, and different cultural uh, manifestations in electronic music, uh, and uh, also, of course, more academic music. We must understand that from Latin America or what we can generate from Latin America and from Central America, everything that we can create, you know, new cultural manifestations that will not necessarily be conditioned by institutions that already have a context, for example, electronic music, that's already a, a context. Let me give you a specific example we collaborate with a, a, a with artists from Japan, and uh, we collaborate with many artists with different genres, and we do instrumental reggaeton, which is played in 
clubs and, and discotheques in in, uh, in Japan. And that's uh, that involves many collectives, NAFNI, Oviedra in Argentina. They all create electronic music and explore their own sound. I think this allows us to understand our own music better, understand our own context, and understand the different uh, musical expressions that are very advanced in some cases. But that have never had the access or the protagonism of other musical expressions. But in many contexts, there is already an origin, there is already a space where uh, this happens. There's a geographical context. So it's not about integrating because we live in a globalized world and I can decide to embrace a certain aesthetic and transform it. I think the idea is to how to create a level playing field with all of the expressions included. Yes, and understand that, of course, we value Jeff Mills uh, or other artists, but we can also value someone who works from Venezuela or many other musicians and even artists, sound artists that uh, have uh, artistic expressions through electronic music, through other uh, forms as well. So that's what we do in Paria. We do very alternative music. We also do more pop music, urban sounds, uh, a lot of folk based music. We are developing the folklore uh, music to develop not necessarily through fusion, but just by like deconstructing the instruments used and creating our own sound. In Los Correos Turbados in Mexico is one of the examples in which we've uh, developed this kind of music based on a, an aesthetic approach. It includes people who think differently, but who also have a certain way of experiencing certain things. They have their own experiences, they have their own aesthetics, and there's a relationship between the aesthetic, the context, and the generation of music. All of this creates like a new uh, format for pop music. So that's basically what we do in Padia. Then we have, of course, links and other things, not just based on what we offer, but also uh, including that sort of musical scene that has been around for a long time and that has a basis on many things. What happened with like house music or with ghetto house, Chicano ghetto house and everything that we try to uh, do and try to define how these musical expressions can access a, a larger context and to provide it with more visibility and not that chauvinism of saying only Latin American things. No, it really be open, have access and, and to have really interesting exchanges and, and being able to access other forms of musical expression. And now going into uh, the subject matter of this uh, this meeting, this conversation. I really enjoy uh, Alejandra and the British Council as well for organizing it. My position regarding the uh, proposal of new trends through fusion, I think, we need to understand the intention, the intention of true exchange and how to look for this from your own perspective and not from pre-established patterns. Because sometimes when we create certain repeated patterns or we fall into them, what ends up happening is that it's something that, yes, you add on to a pile, but that does not really generate and multiply. So I think that it's important that in addition to obviously uh, valuing established genres, house, etc., uh, 
rave in general, uh, hard house, ghetto house, merengue, all of these things, everything that has been pre-established already, all of that uh, construction can be more profound and certain sonorities and sounds can be applied to other things. In the Dominican context, for example, like they, they, they play certain instruments and certain rhythm boxes as if, they, if it was merengue, but then it ends up being like techno. So uh, not, you know, not being too straight to the techno, classical techno forms, but the groove maybe has uh, uh, a different type of, of element. That's my position. And I think that there are many possibilities in the sense that allows us to, first of all, to deconstruct the process better, but also better understand the aesthetics uh, that are related to materialism and that has to do with all of these uh, trends of really wanting to show, yes, being black uh, and having those deeper roots, yes, to show more of who we are deep down and uh, to show our skin, to show who we are. So try to contribute and try to give access to these types of expressions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We will, uh, of course, uh, go back to these uh, points as we continue our discussion. I think that many of the things that were mentioned will have a lot to do with what Feli Cabrera Lopez, our guest from uh, Colombia and Argentina, she is a producer, um, a music producer, transmedia artist, trans binary activist, and Colombian teacher based in Buenos Aires. She has a research institute based on uh, trans and non-binary studies and that she will be describing along with uh, the, uh, the work that she does with the different generations and how these generations overcome the obstacles through music and mix the different genres in achieving so. Thank you very much, Feli, for being us. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mauricio, oh, Chris, oh, Ma hi, Mario. Thank you very much to the organizers and all the other fellow panelists. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be uh, listening and to be participating in this type of conversation. I think that it's good to have these exchanges from our own perspective and knowing uh, what the methodologies are and uh, that everything is different in terms of how creativity is executed and uh, how we develop this uh, from the perspective of countries with different levels of access and of course each context. I am an electronic music producer and I'm part of the Amplify DI, DAI program, which is an initiative for the inclusion of women and uh, dissidents in uh, a non-binary persons in digital music. And besides this, I am a multidisciplinary artist. And in that multidisciplinary approach, I include the different roles of being a programmer, a visual artist, working with different uh, mediums and uh, try to uh, apply a curatorship approach. We created a platform called Expanded Aesthetics in a partnership between Colombia and Argentina. And we also developed a program called Fragmenta. When we take this to uh, the topic that we are discussing today, I want to introduce myself as someone who tries to 
break this these boundaries between the different genres of course there is a more of a gender identity uh, struggle uh, that i that i fight every day but it's also the blurred line between the genders uh, that's part of the activism also within uh, the artistic practices and the different ways in which we can create identity which has to do with uh, these mixes and these transformations of things that are considered more generic. I think that one of the strengths, as you were saying, that we have in Latin America is this possibility of uh, taking these, uh, these mixes of races and ethnicities and, and put it at the service of, of more contemporary artistic practices within my my work what i look for is in a way taking uh from a very personal perspective trying to take tools that have to do with my history uh that is divided between colombia and argentina this mix and see how this can uh create a dialogue with other places and other contexts. I think that music is very closely tied to, I mean, we have the genres, we have techno, and we have these mixes between these rigid lines, other musics, more folklore, more, in, in, in my case, I'm very interested in Andean rhythms. Uh, I'm from the Andean region. region. And in this translinearity, I like to think about music beyond music and how music can be construed also uh, from a broader language, for example, visual music or arts and science and uh, transmedia, robotics, uh, everything that has to do with this interaction. And to have all of those connections, these hybrid uh, ties might seem a bit crazy, as I don't know, even crazier things, music and microbes or anthropology and gender studies uh, mixed with, with music. I think all of this help us, helps us enrich our cultural heritage and dialogue with other cultural heritages in a more uh in a broader way but also one that belongs more to us i think that identity in this sense is very important yes our own way in argentina one of the things that we see in the programs where i teach which is technology and aesthetics of electronic arts we talk a lot about the aesthetics and what the difference is between the people who generate art from a very limited resources and sort of complex resources uh, in Argentina is, you know, just finding elements, sort of cutting them out and mix them, mixing them up and creating our own instruments, I don't know, with a broken computer and mixing all of these things together and how it's different to work with these types of resources. And if you, I mean, also improvisations and work, work, I don't know, in a lab, a scientific institution with a certain, you know, time over the weeks. I mean, I think it's very interesting, as Mauricio was saying uh, about the kids in Cuba, it's very interesting to see how we can create a poetic uh, from the point of view of limitation, but not to romanticize the, those shortcomings or limitations, but also how that creates a possibility of innovating when one is faced with limitations. It's not about the resource, it's about the poetics behind that resource. And so in that sense, I think that we can look for equality and equity together with everyone in the world who is attempting to do this. So I think that's in a way my approach. My approach uh, in Amplify uh, DAI, I participated as an artist and connections between microbiology and uh, sound and visual arts. I have different projects, including one 
techno experimental that has to do with techno experimental uh, and on the other hand a transmedia process uh, with a more interdisciplinary approach I think that that's basically my areas of interest where I'm interested in positioning myself uh, also to give value uh, to whoever tries to move forward from a point of view of dissidency. I think that being a dissident uh, or the term dissident, it's one of the most uh, fruitful and creative terms uh, that really allows for um, a development of these artistic expressions. And I think that as an artist and as a producer, this is very important. So thank you. Not much more than that. Thank you so much, Felipe. And now we are connecting the dots, right? Cuba, uh, we see the pariah scenario, and now we are going through this, um, the cultural dissidents. We're working um, with this exercise of uh, questioning. And now we will give the floor to Johnny Nyrens. We are super happy to have a, a woman who inspires so many other women around the world, not only in the UK, and someone who has devoted her career as an artist, a producer, to empower Black voices or Afro-descendant voices in the UK and around the world. Without further ado, Janine, we are looking forward to hearing to you from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I should just say, you know, I'm not really an artist. I'm more, you know, a producer, creative producer, um, but also just somebody who wanted to address um, issues around um, underrepresentation, both of, of people of colour, you know, people who look like me and who came from a similar background as me, um, you know, so people of colour and, and women in jazz, you know, and when I first came into this, when I met my partner, Gary Crosby, who's the other half of the company um, 30 years ago, um, the, the jazz scene looked very different from what it looks like now. You know, it was very, very white, very middle class, very male. Um, we, we had a saying, it was male, pale and stale. And it was, you know, a lot of older white men who were making up um, not only the... Um, the artistic content that, that people were seeing on the stage, but also in the audience. And, but the, the promoters were all oddly enough saying, I don't know what's happening. You know, the jazz audience is dying off. And, you know, it, it seemed obvious to me, the reason for that is that they were only programming for themselves. They were programming people who looked like them and who had similar interests to them. But unfortunately, they were all, you know, over 50 and getting older as the years went on and slowly dying off. So, you know, it followed that audience was getting smaller and smaller. And what needed to happen, I think, was for there to be a real shift in who was being seen on, on the stage so that we could inspire younger people to come into the music. So you needed to see you know, younger people performing on the stage and also younger people um, in charge of promoting um, music, you know. It, so there was a whole, I mean, it was a radical change that was needed. But in terms of who was coming into the music at the time, there were no black uh, teachers in the conservatoires. There were very few 
um, black teacher, music teachers in schools. So changing it at that end, you know, at the beginning um, to see a difference uh, in what was happening on the professional stage um, was kind of where Gary and I saw our role. And it, it was, we had to be quite systemic about it. So that, you know, the first stage was about changing, you know, who can they see now and developing a group of people, um, uh, black musicians, who we could get to a level of professionalism that they could then get out and tour and be seen further afield than London. Um, so that, that's kind of what we did. You know, we started with a small group of people, developed them over three years. And then as they moved uh, further into the profession, we brought in another younger group of people who would run a jam session each week. And then, you know, they would bring their friends to the jam session. So slowly, slowly over the years, you started to see the audience change as the artists on the stage change. But what was really great, I think, was that we did it without alienating the older, more traditional jazz audience. And I think that that was one of the great successes, I think, because it could have gone the other way, you know, and we could have split the audience. But I think we managed somehow um, to retain the existing audience and then bring in a new and younger audience and start to build um, a, a bigger, broader community of people who were listening to jazz. And um, what we saw, I mean, that was back in 91. And um, in 2009, having developed a, a number of groups, you know, like Dennis Baptiste, um, Soweto Kinch, um, you know, various people, Robert Mitchell, Jason Yard, lots of them. Um, we were invited to uh, be residents at the South Bank Centre in London, which is one of Europe's uh, largest multi-arts centres. And we started there with a, um, a programme on a Saturday afternoon where we were able to just say to young people, you know, just come down, come down and play. And there was no prerequisite. You just needed to play your, know how to play your instrument. Um, but we didn't audition anybody. So, you know, you remove that barrier. We also don't charge anything. Our program is 100% free at the point of access. So that removed another barrier. And making sure that we had uh, black music leaders meant that the, the young people that we were trying to reach could see that there was somebody who looked like them, that they, you know, they had something in common with. Um, so that they would feel at least a level of um, comfort, I think, in having somebody who was had a cultural connection with them. So that was the first thing. And then as we, as we managed to um, settle down in the South Bank Centre, we had a bigger space, we had a regular space, um, more and more young people came and you know, slowly we managed to get more space, more time at the South Bank Centre, which helped us to develop a much broader programme that, um, from what started as pretty much a jam session on a Saturday afternoon to what is now, um, well, pre-pandemic, it was five days a week at the South Bank Centre, I think it's 24 hours a week, um, doing 11 or 12 different sessions for young people aged 11 to 25. And so now we've, we can progress, you know, a young person all the way through from the time they start with us at age 11, all the way through to the profession. And we don't, um, you know, that's a weekly program where they're getting um, tuition, jazz training um, from professional music um, leaders who are practicing artists and internationally touring artists um, and they're getting it firsthand for free which is fantastic for them so um, but we don't just do the educational side we also work with professional artists as creative producers so that there is a professional outcome we're not just training young people just for the sake of training 
we're training them um, and um, are able to give them a real professional outcome, you know, real paid work, professional work that will help them establish themselves as professional artists on the, you know, in the professional industry. And so that's where you see, you know, artists like um, Shabaka Hutchins, uh, Nabaya Garcia, Moses Boyd, Binka Golding, all of these people, Ezra Collective, um, Nerea, all of these um, groups have come out of the Tomorrow's Warriors program that we've built at the South Bank Centre. Um, and they now uh, come back to our program uh, because our, our ethos is each one teach one. And so there's an understanding that, you know, you come through the program, you progress, you go on, but then you always come back and you share that, uh, that learning, that knowledge, that experience with the young people who are following in their footsteps. Um, that's kind of a, the deal, <laughs> you know, is the payback for the, um, you know, all that free, all those years of free, free training. Um, but they do it willingly. And um, this weekend, actually, at South Bank Centre, we celebrated our 30th anniversary and we were able to bring together, I think it was about 130 of our alumni um, for an amazing picture. Um, I don't know if any of you know of that famous, it's an iconic picture by Art Kane called A Great Day in Harlem. And it's got um, all the, the jazz icons of the New York jazz scene standing in front of a brownstone building in New York. Um, it's a very, very famous photograph. And we tried to recreate that with Tomorrow's Warriors. And we, I think in that photo, there were 57 artists and with our one I think we had about 100 and it was over 100 musicians just amazing really and they did a concert where we were able to show um, all the different generations of warriors over the past 30 years coming together and you know we had Shabaka Hutchins um, it's Sons of Kemet actually it was the Sons of Kemet um, playing with our junior band who had learned one of the Sons of Kemet pieces. And to see, you know, these 11, 12, 13 year olds sharing the stage with Shabaka and, and his musicians, it was extraordinary. And it was very beautiful because there was no, um, there was no ego, you know, on the part of the professional artists. They were there and really enjoying sharing with these young people. And, also beautiful, beautiful was the fact that the young people were not at all phased by sharing the stage with such, you know, an incredible artist, you know, this world-beating artist. So I think that sense of uh, lineage, that connection, that um, sense of community that we've been able to build over time with the warriors means that you know young people now have it's like a ready-made community that they can they can join so easily whereas before going back 30 years it there were so many barriers for a young person to enter this music um so i feel you know we feel very proud of, of that that there is now this very big community of us i mean it's hundreds and hundreds of them um, that can all um, support each other. It is a self-sustaining community now, where they're all employing each other, they're all in each other's bands. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of what Tomorrow's Warriors um, is about. And I think we've seen, you know, over the years, seen that change in the demographic of who is playing jazz now. You see a lot more women involved in jazz and being confident about going to jam sessions. Whereas prior, prior to this, it was so male dominated that a lot of women wouldn't go to jam sessions. You know, there was just too much testosterone on the stage and, you know, that needed to be broken down. So, um, but now we've got, you know, lots of female band leaders. I mean, you look at Nabaya's band, she's got um, a lot of male 
um, artists in there, all of whom have the utmost respect for her as a, as a leader, as a composer. Um, so, yeah, I think slowly, slowly we're, we're breaking down those barriers, not only in terms of um, race and culture, but also gender as well and how the, you know, the, all the, um, everyone interacts with each other. Um, in terms of who, who else is, um, you know, how, or how people get involved um, in jazz, we're looking at, um, you know, we, we work a lot with lots of schools, um, with music services who coordinate the schools, with um, sort of amateur community groups. Um, we're always looking towards growing the community for music. So whenever we take out, um, we go on tour with one of our professional orchestras, we will always include an outreach element in every city that we go to so that we're connecting, you know, making a, a stronger, more permanent connection with the audiences and with the communities in the places where we go. Because it's too easy to do a tour where you just go to a venue, you play, you go home. And it's very hard to build a connection with an audience that way. So the way we work is always to um, look at what, the, what is needed within the community in terms of outreach. How can we contribute to that? How can we help them engage more with the music? And then we work closely with them with the venue, with the promoter, with the uh, music service, the schools, and try and connect up all these dots locally so that even after we've gone, we've built that relationship within the local partners so they can continue that work until we come back possibly the following year to pick up again with that community of people and um, continue building the audience. And we, we've seen... You know, we have seen um, growth in our audiences around the country as a result of that. So there are, you know, other organisations, um, of course, who are doing um, work with young people. There's um, an organisation called Connecticut Blocko, for example, that actually acts as a feeder for us, where they're working more, more at a community level, um, and a lot of sort of drumming, um, drumming and um, the teaching of, of instruments, whereas we pick it up later where they've already learned the instrument and then they've, it's a nice progression route for them. Um, also important are you know, younger promoters, as I said, people like Jazz Refreshed, um, who run a, a regular weekly uh, session and who have been giving a lot of our young... Oh, um, emerging artists their first um, professional gig or their first professional recording um, so again it, it's um, um, Janine oh yes um, tiempo se nos, se nos va. Um, it's almost time oh, and I'm I would really like to uh, wrap up no it's great thank you it's been a pleasure to listen to you and to understand the narrative of the work you do um, for so long. And just to wrap up, I'd like to um, read the stories we have told so those who are listening to this can um, understand. We've talked about four kinds of conflict where music has become a vehicle for resiliency and for development. We're talking about geopolitical conflicts. In the case of Bitly, we're talking about class conflicts. We're talking about, in the case of Feli, of gender. And in Janine's case, we are talking about opportunities and race and gender, gender as well. In these four conflicts, music has gathered us and has led us to develop platforms, individual or group platforms for resiliency and 
for development. And these platforms have um, their costs or have uh, different types of scopes. In the case of Janine's organization, the work in the long term, in the case of more direct platforms like the rest of us, we attack uh, the conflict as we see it in the moment. And the truth is, uh, we really appreciate your being here. We only have three minutes for some questions and otherwise we're gonna meet in the next session. Okay, no one, is everyone ready? Everyone okay? I would only like to say something just to, um, as a conclusion, I thought it was really nice to see that we all share the power we see in lacking, of course, in each situation where we lack things. I believe that when there's a lack of anything, when there's uh, poverty, I, I think you can manage to make a lot of impact. And that's a new opportunity for other expressions. So that's my conclusion. Thank you very much. That's great. Feli, Yanin, thank you so much for being here. We hope you can join us on our YouTube channel of our festival. We'll be in touch and I'll leave the floor to Mario Oliva so he can wrap up. I'm really thankful you have all presented very interesting stories. We're very happy and let's hope that the audience who has participated feels the same. I would like to thank our panelists and our collaborators, British Council, PDT, Selector Pro, and Cordobas Biennale. I think we've made a great team and Let's hope we can uh, keep on meeting. And it's been great to be with you all in this journey across music. Bye-bye. Thank you.